Welcome to our Sunday service. My name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Northern Lights Christian Fellowship Church of the Nazarene here in Jetwin. Many of Paul's letters to the various churches were written to correct and teach their members. Paul had a large area to cover and many of these letters were written when Paul was under house arrest. The people that attended these churches were as varied as their areas and we have to remember that Christianity was still in its infancy. Many had not been believers for very long. We did a study in Corinthians and we saw some of the issues Paul addressed in these letters. We can certainly appreciate the differences that would have been prevalent in these churches. We know there were many differences between the churches in the lower mainland now and the churches up here in the north. You would see these differences if you were to attend the district assemblies. Some of these differences are simply due to the number of people that are down in the lower mainland compared to here. The hubbub and the rush that takes place when you say, are say in Vancouver compared to the lack of rush here in Chetwin. And people are different. This is not a bad thing, but it does color the way we worship. Churches all around the world today come in all styles and shapes. We've seen church services being held in large arenas. We've read about secret worship services taking place in the bottom of coal mines and in outdoor toilets in persecuted countries. Here in Chetwin, we have celebrated down in Spirit Park with all denominations participating. And I can remember attending a church service in a bowling alley in Romania. And yes, they were still bowling. Building styles may be different, music may be different, and the language spoken may even be different. But God's church cannot be confined to four walls. God's church is made up of people from every race, every nation, and they all love Christ and are committed to following Him. That is the common denominator. One of the most prominent of those churches was at Ephesus. Paul had established this church on his third missionary trip, and he stayed there for three years preaching and teaching. The letter to Ephesus was written by Paul, but was not a letter of correction. Ephes Ephesians was written to encourage and to teach. We can learn a great deal about the heart of Paul and the heart of God as we read these letters. Now we have to realize that most of Paul's letters were circulated to all of the churches and became a textbook of the faith. When Paul wrote this letter, he was under house arrest for preaching the good news and could not visit the church personally. This is one letter that does not address any particular problems in the church. Ephesus was one of five major cities in the Roman Empire. Paul had visited Ephesus on his second missionary journey and established that church. So let's see what he wrote. Ephesians 1 verse 1 to 3. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you peace and grace. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united in Christ. What a beautiful way to begin a letter. Faithful followers of Jesus Christ. These early words of Paul to the church would have been an encouragement just on their own. So what would it take for people to characterize a person as a faithful follower of Christ? Well, some things to think about as we continue with this letter would be hold fast to your faith. Take one day at a time. Faithfully obey God in every detail of your life. But I'm sure that Paul will make this all clear as we move on. Verses 4 to 8. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace He has poured out on us who belong to His dear Son. He is so rich in kindness and in grace 
that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Our salvation is totally dependent on God. We are not saved because we deserve it. We are not saved because we've paid the price for it. We are saved because God was gracious and freely gave it to us. That is God's love. We did not convince God that we needed to be saved. He already knew that. And that was his great and glorious plan right from the beginning of time. We see the beginning of the plan when God had to expel Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. So we can in no way take credit for our salvation. The good news is, because of Jesus' sacrifice of his life on the cross, we are redeemed. Because of Christ's shed blood, God looks at us as if we've never sinned. The penalty has been paid. That God decided in advance to adopt us is another way of saying that salvation is God's doing and not our own. We are adopted as his own children. Christ's sacrifice brought us into his family and made us heirs along with Christ. Paul uses this term to show the church in Ephesus just how strong the relationship to God is. If you're an orphan, you know how valuable that precious adoption paper is. The Bible is our adoption paper, and Christ's blood is the signature on that paper. To speak of Jesus' blood points to two wonderful truths, redemption and forgiveness. Redemption was the price paid to gain the freedom of a slave, and we have been freed from our slavery to sin. Forgiveness was granted because Christ was the perfect and final sacrifice for that sin. Paul knows about God's grace because he experienced it firsthand. Jesus met Paul on that road to Damascus and Paul's life changed. A man who had been known all over the kingdom as a persecutor of believers became an apostle who was appointed by God. He became one of the persecuted. Paul knew quite well that he didn't deserve it and no amount of effort on his part could have earned it, yet God did it. Even in this day and age, God continues to shower his kindness on us. This is God's grace. Grace is defined as undeserved favor. We can't earn it, and we don't deserve it. No, matter amount, no amount of effort can gain it. It's all his grace. All we can do is accept it, believe it, and live it. And to top it all off, he did it for all people. Ephesians 1, 9-14 God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure, and this is that plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance. He makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we... Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believe in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. God did not keep this mysterious plan a secret, but this plan for the whole world could not be fully understood until Christ rose from the dead. His purpose for sending Christ was to unite the Jews and the Gentiles into one body with Christ as the head. I love the term that Paul uses here, at the right time. There are many people who, who even in this day and age don't understand God's plan. But his promise is, at the right time, he will bring us together to be with him forever. Sometimes I even have difficulty understanding his timing. There are days, like the days we're in right now, that I think his timing should be different. But really, his timing has always been perfect. So who am I that I should doubt? I would love it if this COVID virus was over with and things could go back to normal. But there were things about the way we were that we don't want to go back to. We've had time to think about God and to ponder his purpose for our lives. We've had time to serve our neighbors in ways we've never had before. And we've had more than a few opportunities 
to take our concerns to God in prayer and watch for those answers. Will we get too busy, too focused on trying to recoup our losses when all of this is over, that we will forget about the God that we have met in the midst of disaster? That's a good question, don't you think? Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he has called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Paul's prayer is a prayer for believers, for believers to know God better. So how do you get to know one, someone? By reading God's word that is inspired by God through the prophets and the kings, by reading God's history book. All of this will help, but that only tells us about that person. The best way to get to know God better is to spend time with him. He has gifted us with the Holy Spirit to help us with these things. That personal relationship with God will change your life. Watch for God's hand in your life. Pray and keep track of the answered prayers and do the things he's asked us to do. Love your neighbor, minister to the needy, visit the shut-ins. In this day of COVID, a friendly phone call may be an answer to their desperate prayer. Micah 6, verse 8. Know, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God.